Hi, everybody. Welcome to Maker Monday. You know I'm excited because that's what I get on Mondays. Excited to be here. I was going to do, first of all, y'all asked for more demos, um, more materials. When we ask for what would you like to see in the surveys, those were some of your responses. And um, you've been answering the survey a little bit more because I've been um, bribing you with stuff. So there may be another bribe at the end of today, but lots of demos and how to use it, virtual, that kind of stuff. And I think this webinar is gonna lend itself to that, but it also was just a great way to start off the um, November, December season um, of stuff and talking about what's your favorite art materials. And I was gonna do like my favorite things. And then I remembered that, yeah, Oprah does that. And so I probably shouldn't try to steal from Oprah. Although you probably should steal from the best. Well, then I got thinking about art teachers and what they need and kind of reminded me of the movie, The Jerk with Steve Martin, which sounds like a backhanded compliment with The Jerk, but, he has acquired all this wealth and his life is falling apart and he's going to leave his home. And he says, I don't need any of this stuff. All I need is, and I think he grabs an ashtray. And as he's walking out, he keeps adding to it. And I need this and I need this and I need this. And it made me giggle because I thought when you talk to somebody who loves art materials and when you talk to an art teacher, um, Oh yeah, they always have that um, back closet packed full of stuff that they need. And so I started thinking, what were my go-to things, the all I need things. And so I think today is gonna be fun because I'm gonna go through 10 different things. I'm also going to give you a little brief demonstration. And I, I say this all the time, just so that you know, like I don't have an art education background. Um, or um, I'm not trained as a fine artist. I am your student. And I think that makes it maybe even a little bit better because you know, oh my gosh, if Chris is doing it, you know, my K through 12 can do it. Your, your upper grades are gonna be way better than I am. But you know, keep me on that elementary level and we're good. So I love that all of these materials look like they've been used hard because they truly and honestly belong to me. These are products that I brought from home so that you could see what my favorite go-to things are, the all I needs, and I brought art to show you and I'm gonna demonstrate a little bit. So in your handouts, and everybody, I apologized if you've gotten a PowerPoint that the links don't work, I had all the links tested this time. And so if they don't work for you, check like um, compatibility, but by all means, let me know and I will do my best to work with you so that you can get the handout in its full. But it's going to list the product and take you right to the website so you can see how much it costs, um, what the part number is, all that kind of stuff. Um, the, a better description than the Chris Bakke description that I'm gonna give you. And it'll give you all the information. And then um, some of the art you will see in this presentation, some of it will be on the PowerPoint, but hopefully that's all you need. So I'm gonna start with, um, I'll get my PowerPoint up and we'll kind of flip back and forth to a couple different views, but I'm gonna start at the top with multimedia paper. Multimedia paper, um, this is the NASCO brand. It's the 90 pound. And this is a product that when I was doing merchandising, I tested. I actually took the, I think it's a 50, a 60, and the 80 pound is what it is. Um, yep, 80 pound. I swear I get that mixed up all the time. 80 pound paper. And I put it underneath the faucet at 
in our break room and I just held it under the faucet for a super long time until it finally compromised the paper. But it held up to a lot, a lot, a lot of water. And then I took um, brush and watercolor and I brushed and brushed and brushed and brushed and added more um, watercolor. And again, it held up really, really well. So it's um, wet and dry. It's good for watercolor, but honestly, I would say like get this as your go-to paper um, and use it for everything. But then if you wanna do a true watercolor piece of art, have the kids practice on the multimedia and then buy the watercolor paper for the actual assignment. But this, um, for, the, for the price, you're going to love this. The next item that I have to have, the all I need is Mod Podge. And um, yeah, it's a gallon and um, Andy, our photo manager, like I'm sure you brought a gallon. I'm like, that's what I have at my house. In fact, I have two gallons at my house because I use it a ton. And uh, you see the um, bird um, collage. I do a lot of mixed media. And I think the reason I do mixed media is because you know, nobody can say like birds don't ride bicycles. Um, you know, it gives me that freedom of choice. So I want to show you um, what I love about Mod Podge is that it is like the most amazing adhesive. This is magazine, the flower is made out of magazine and the border is made out of magazine and the grass. The bird and these little side flowers here are napkin and so, it didn't destroy the napkin at all, even though it's a lot more delicate paper. The bicycle was from a calendar. And I say that because you know that a calendar would be a little bit more uh, like card stocky, a little um, heavier. And then the little rooster was also magazine. The background is acrylic. It was bubble wrap that I did a print of. I will also show you this one I did in quarantine. And I only giggle because I get excited that I like my own art. This was done on a um, grocery bag. Um, and I believe it's a lot of watercolor paper and um, monoprint pad paper. Again, you can see that I used some other art materials, but all of it was. Um, glued down with Mod Podge. Sometimes I use a glue stick and Mod Podge, but Mod Podge can be a varnish. It can be an adhesive. Um, it's great for collaging. Um, it's decent for paper mache. I probably would um, suggest another product for that. Just save your Mod Podge for the collaging, but it's fab fabulous for collaging. This one also too, I think this one's kind of cool because this one is going to give you that um, glossy finish and Mod Podge comes in both a gloss and a matte medium. And so um, this dinosaur that ends up looking kind of like a pizza, is made out of monoprint paper that I just tore and then I mod podged down. I was really proud of I was really proud of the teeth because um, I don't really do fine detail work very good, but um, yeah, so I ended up calling that one Pizzasaurus. And so, but just to sort of give you a little bit of an idea um, on Mod Podge is. Again, I'm gonna use the multimedia paper. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll put down um, like a piece of craft paper as a placemat, but then that turns into a cool piece of art too. So when I'm using Mod Podge, I just take my brush and I'm gonna be talking more about these brushes. So take note of the brush, but I'm gonna, sometimes I do a little bit on the actual paper, and on the piece that I am gluing down. And then I just Mod Podge right on top. And it's funny because if you 
don't know what Mod Podge is, I am super excited to introduce you to it. I would be surprised if teachers in this audience, art teachers, don't know Mod Podge because I think most of you do. Um, but if you don't, welcome to the world of Mod Podge. This happened to be a monoprint that um, it was pretty plain. And so because it was pretty plain, I just decided I'm going to start collaging with it. And this is the part that I love about collage is you can just put it down. You can see I got a little wrinkle there. So I'm just going to lift it up. I am notorious for not wearing gloves and using my hands. And I will tell you, it kind of is like when you used to get like Elmer's glue on your hands and you'd peel it off. It gets all over your hands, but it's kind of epic and awesome and cathartic. I'm not even kidding you. So Mod Podge can be used with all kinds of different papers like I shared with you, tissue paper and cardstock. Um, foils, anything like that. In fact, I'll set that aside for the moment. In fact, this piece is a print. Um, and I will be honest, I'm uh, super proud of it. It's called um, Eggplant Trashin. Um, it was a dress. Um, and I called it eggplant because this color was called eggplant. It was torn from a paper bag. The top part of this was a Zentangle ad in School Arts Magazine. The bow was actually a real um, bow from the bag. And all of the strips of the dress were material. So this collaged really beautiful. It was on canvas that I did it. I had um, painted the back with um, NASCO acrylic, and then I mod podged all of it down, and it just turned out, I thought, lovely, which is weird to call your own art lovely, but I hope that's okay. I think art teachers encourage that kind of stuff. So question, um, how do you clean the brush after using Mod Podge? Well, you know what I do? I put it in the water, and... Um, after I put it in the water, I take it to my sink and I put it all under the um, faucet until all of that white stuff comes out. I have let them dry before because I've gotten lazy. And if you take a little bit of hot water and Dawn dish soap, which, which the folks at Royal Brush will probably be mad at me for saying because, you know, there's better cleaners. But the truth is, these Royal Brush, um, Big Kids brushes take that much abuse and I just wash and wash and wash. But if you keep them in water, it keeps it moist enough so that it doesn't dry and get all sticky because that's what makes it a lot harder to um, clean. Next on my list is, I can't live without these watercolor by Faber-Castell. They're called, it's called the connector set. And this is the deluxe set. It does come with a brush and I just lost it in my art room. Um, it's also a very nice brush though. I enjoy it. I love the fact that with these you can, and I am going to show you how to use them. So I should keep that a little bit closer to me and grab a brush. But, um, I love the, this was just a practice sheet and I was just showing the different colors and just playing around, but you can see that it's very brilliant. Um, my next one is um, where I just took some tape and I taped it down on some paper. I think this was actually a watercolor sheet of paper, but you can see that you can get um, a, a little bit lighter. You can also go way darker, but they are just really fabulous watercolors. I am gonna grab, so this was some India ink that I had just done with a marker dauber and I better not dip it in the Mod Podge. And now I'm just going to show you that straight out of, 
straight out of the pan without a whole lot of water. They're just really, really um, opaque and I just think brilliant and beautiful. But I also can add a lot more water and I can put some of my water down on the paper first. And you can see that I can get a lot more of a watercolory look. And I think that only with art teachers can you say a watercolory look. For me, I felt like when I used these, that the fact that you could get so dark, and this again, this um, brush is a nylon brush. Uh, the brush that comes with the Faber-Castell watercolor connector set is a watercolor brush. And so it might perform a little bit differently, but I love how dark you can get and the black. So this is going to be the black watercolor against real India ink. And look at how nicely that performs. And I know that that is you know, going to be a little bit uh, of a shade lighter. But if I really work the palette, look at how dark I can get. The other, I keep going towards that Mod Podge. I got to set that aside. The other cool part about these is that they do come apart. And you can actually buy them in um, individuals, I, that's not completely true. I believe you buy an individual color in a pack of six or a pack of 12, but then you can connect them. You can connect them in um, like a color family. Maybe you want to do skin tones. And so you're going to put, and maybe you would put you guys have to tell me if this would be right. Maybe you would put like a, a magenta in there so that you could get some, some pinks and reds and maybe um, utilize the little tube of the um, white. This is sort of a blending. It's a, it's a, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a liquid sort of, let me show you. How about that? It's right in front of me again the lid becomes a very cool palette. And so I can put that in there, the little white in there and get my brush, get my black out of it. And let's see if we can make a great skin tone. I'm gonna take a little bit of the white and a little bit of this brown Let's see if, oh yeah, that would be a beautiful skin tone. If I wanted to go darker, I don't know if I should add that to the white. This is where color mixing needs art teachers. But it's also, I think the really great part about this, yeah, that's a beautiful brown. And I'm curious, look at how lighter that one got when it dried a little bit. And then I'm curious if I took a little bit of pink and a little bit of white and a little bit of that tan, if that would get like sort of a little bit, yeah, a little bit more of a lighter tone so that you can, because everybody's skin is different. And so not all the browns are gonna be um, the same and not all the the um, the lighter colors or the um, tans and so you know you just have kids put their hands in the middle to show that you know even what falls under what's supposed to be a specific race and just recently I have stopped marking the race box because I think we should all just be the human race. And so, but I love these. I love them because that is a fabulous lesson that you can do. Um, warm colors, cool colors, 
and they go back nicely in the case. And I only say that because sometimes I struggle to connect them appropriately. But they do, I promise you they do. I just, the last one is always a little bit of a, um, a catch, but they work and kids can do them super duper good. Otherwise they'll just leave them like that. Let me check too, what sizes and amount does the mixed media paper come in? The, they come in reams of 500, there's 50 pound, 60 pound and 80 pound, I believe. I recommend the 80 if you really want to use, do like some watercolor stuff, just because obviously it holds up really well. Like that was India ink and you can't see it on the back. And, um, you know, even if, even if I do a whole, whole lot of water on it, it doesn't um, compromise the paper hardly at all. Eventually it will bore a hole in it. Um, because it's not 100% natural paper, but it, like I said, it's fabulous and it's one of my favorite papers to use and it's um, reasonable. Please don't ask me prices, I'm the worst. And so that's why I put the links on there. So next is um, what I've been using is the um, Royal Brush Big Kids brushes. And what I loved about the Royal Brush Big Kids brushes, <laughs> you love my mustache. Um, how, you know, I, it's hard to show a tool and an art material, but I use these for everything. I use them for watercolor, I use them for tempera, I use them for acrylic, I use them for Mod Podge. Um, I have six grandchildren and three of them do art with me, probably four of them. And they abuse them, but they're, they're a fabulous product. And so every time I paint today, I will be using these, um, the acrylic handle easily washed. The grip is awesome. Um, the greens are round, the reds are flat. So that sort of helps kids um, learn the different tips. And, um, and I, I, gotta, I gotta be honest with you, um, the gentleman who um, was working in the education market for Royal Brush, um, also one of the owners, his name was Bill DeVellos, probably one of the most beautiful human beings I've ever met in my life. He has um, since um, passed away. And so there is something um, just near and dear to my heart too when I use a big kid's brush. So that is definitely a go-to. Um, best brushes. Thank you, Megan. Um, totally agree on that. Um, so next is acrylic. So as long as we're talking about brushes, let's talk about acrylic paint. NASCO bulk acrylic. And I will be honest, I typically refer to it just as NASCO's acrylic paint. We probably will be rebranding this. These are some things that I have done um, in the past and both recently, the cat um, was Mr. Whisker. Somebody said, can you paint my cat? And I'm like, your actual cat? I don't think that would be appropriate. Just teasing. Um, but I was like, really, no, I can't because I'm not that kind of artist, but I can do a rendition of it and it'll be fun. And um, the good news is she loved it. So that is Mr. Whiskers, but that was all done with NASCO's um, acrylic paint. Here is what I wanna show you that I think is super cool. So these squares that I have are NASCO's acrylic paint. That one's a white. And so these are some colors that you don't see on my table right now, but these are a set that come in a kit by Jeannie Stizinski, who is also known as Mrs. Jeannie. And so Mrs. Jeannie took our palette of colors and then started creating and mixing. And let me, so all the squares were the actual out of the bottle. But then look at some of these beautiful colors that she mixed. 
And when you buy um, Mrs. Jeannie's um, painted paper art kit, which her painted papers are so fabulous, you actually get a poster with what I like to call the recipes. But this right here, and I've been working at NASCO for a very long time, um, and I've always liked our acrylics. This made me fall in love with them because somebody actually was teaching me how to mix color. And I mean, all of these colors came from this basic set that Mrs. Jeannie put together for us and said, these are the colors I'd like to mix. And these squares were the original. And when I painted these squares, it didn't take a whole lot of coverage. And so let me just take my beautiful deck of cards and set them aside for right now in my super mature bag and show you that so they're kind of puddly. They're not, they're not super duper thick, but the nice part about that is they cover really well. And I'm just gonna do sort of abstracty stuff. And they mix really well. It's always bold to do yellow right after you did black and expect it to work out, but Sometimes things line up appropriately. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna dip like every student does and start mixing a little bit to show you how they mix. Now you'd probably mix want to mix them on the palette versus on the paper, but at least you can see that when I do a little mixing like that. They really do mix nicely and the coverage is great. Again, using NASCO's um, multimedia paper and you can see it is holding up really nicely. This kind of looks like it's almost some fire going on there. And it, I mean, look at, I'm being like every kindergartner and just putting every color on there. And they're not bad in terms of it doesn't get super muddy. Don't worry if I if I overdo it, it will. But for the most part, I can keep painting and painting, and the colors are just brilliant, and the coverage is good. So I think in the world of a beginner for the price and for helping them be successful at how to use paint, it's it's good. I think there's probably better um, adjectives that I can use. I was looking to see if there was another question. Feel free to interact and if you have questions um, or concerns. Every once in a while, paint, um, acrylic paint is sensitive to bacteria. And so when you use paint, it's always best to put it in a palette. If you dip a brush into the paint, any of the germs on the paint, you know, and we're all sensitive of germs right now, um, but any of that kind of stuff sometimes can spoil paint. Um, lots of air in the bottle, if the lid isn't sealed tightly, can also cause some issues too. So every once in a while, um, the paint stinks a little bit if a lot of air or um, bacteria. Try to have kids not do double dipping into the bottle of paint. Um, if it separates, if it's been sitting for a long time, you can just shake it up. Um, it takes a long time for that to get separate -y, if that's a word. I probably need to take some English classes, but it does take a long time for that to happen. So. Um, for me and my money, I like this a whole, whole lot because it works well with other paints that I have. I get lots of um, opportunities to sample other paints and I've mixed other paints with it. I have um, done lots of multimedia with it and it's, I, I like the colors, I like how it performs. And so that is also one of the products that I have to have. 
I think the next thing that I have is almost everybody's, every art teacher's favorite, and that is a Sharpie. A Sharpie marker, black and white is, black and white, black Sharpie on white paper is fantastic. And I giggle because today during a Zoom meeting, I like to doodle. And so I was using a Sharpie marker as I was doing, listening to the Zoom meeting and paying attention, of course, because we all know you can do both. So I just started drawing some what I call straight lines. And if you know me, um, this particular piece um, is a lesson in discipline for me because it's really hard for me not to do something that has a curved line. You can see these are starting to get a little bit loosey goosey, but how much fun is this? And I'm just gonna lift it up just a little teeny bit because I feel like it's taken away from the black and white. But we all know that Sharpie comes in lots of colors. And so this is just a sampling of Sharpies that I have from home. And it's just one of those things where, oh, don't wreck the Sharpie. And, a, and it takes forever for a Sharpie to go bad. Um, but if one of mine has been used to the point where it's just dry, I'm like, throw it away, let's get a new one. So this was just a, a few examples of using colored Sharpie. Again, lots of mark making on here. This was just sort of one of those like Zen tangled hands. Zen tangle is a trademark of all these different things you can do. It's doodling. And so another one was from the community art project. And so I believe at the end of your PowerPoint, um, I added the community circle project. This was um, Sandy Coleman is the creator of the community circle project. And so there's three circle templates that you create. And then you put the words into one of the circles. And this was just love hard. I was watching, um, I was watching a webinar. Um, it was an anti-racist webinar. And so that was sort of my, my takeaway is to love people. And then I was just adding lots of color and it was all Sharpie. This um, was the start of a fun neurographic piece that I will talk a little bit about. And it was colored in with the Faber-Castell watercolors. So the neurographic, I just wanna share because that lesson plan is in there too. You start by just putting some um, just organic lines from one side to the next. And once you do that, then you wanna take your Sharpie and you wanna soften any place that has a corner. And so you can see that where, where the lines met, I'm gonna soften those corners and just, soften them up. And if you know, if you clearly can notice that my lines get thicker, that's because I'm real obsessive compulsive in terms of if I have just like a, like that little piece right there, which by the way, this was purple. I don't know what I did with, I don't know what I did with the black. So that was not smart, but it's in there. There we go. Um, so over here, when I was doing that, I got a little bit of an edge. And anytime I have one of those edges, I like to clean it up a little bit. So my lines get a little bit thicker than most normal people. And it might be smart in this case for me to start off with an ultra fine. But I just love the feel of a fine um, Sharpie. So once you, once you soften all the lines, the corners, then you're going to add some shapes. And so like I might add a triangle up here. I might add a square that's probably more of a rectangle and then a rectangle here. But now I've just created points in which I need to sort of get those all softened up. And when I sort of soften those edges, it definitely changes the shape, but each point often will have um, several sides that you have to consider. 
So you got to really take a look. And it's funny because sometimes when you do one, you'll say like, ooh, I missed that. Great news about neurographic art is there's no, like, like nobody's going to be like, that's not right. But it's very cathartic and therapeutic. And there's more to it than I'm telling you in this short demonstration, which is why I'm giving you the lesson plan. Cheryl Neal from Virginia Art Education Association is the one who introduced it to me. She, she acknowledges the, um, I think he's uh, like a psychotherapist or psychiatrist that came up with it and tells you the history behind it. Lots of people have picked up on it. There's, and I wished I would have wrote down this art teacher's name. She's doing some beautiful illustrations of portraits and um, using neurographic art. And they're phenomenal. They're so, so cool. So that lesson plan is also in your handout. My next I must have is actually really near and dear to my heart. It is the monoprint pad. And the monoprint pad um, is this pad that just looks like a piece of rubber. Um, lots of people think that it is our safety cut and often ask if they can carve it. You could carve this, but it's not going to perform the same as linoleum or safety cut because it is softer. And so the, the cut that you make, um, the material will like bend in. This was NASCO's answer to art teachers who said, I like um, the gel type pads that are out there, but I can't afford them. The four by six um, monoprint pad is inexpensive. I want to say less than $7 with a teacher discount. And once you buy it, you don't have to ever buy it again. In fact, you can see that this one is a little bit stained. I just wanted you to see that these are my real go-to products and what I have for, at home. So I've used this one a ton. In fact, if you could get a little closer, you would see I have like glitter on the side because I tried to um, use glitter one time and it was not good. Um, it stuck all over the place. I wouldn't recommend it. But it did wash off for the, for the most part, as I say that, and I see a couple stuck in there. But a lot of times I just put it on my shelf on top of like a baggie or I put it inside the baggie. Um, and because it's rubbery and plastic, it sticks a little bit, but that's all, that's how I store it. And it will last forever. You don't wanna store it on top of paper or on top of a varnished desk or wood because the plastic emits a little bit of oil and it will lift off um, paper. It will lift off um, like a finish or the varnish on the wood. Um, the nice part about the paper is if that happens, you can take it to the sink and just scrub it off. I've used a Scotch-Brite scrubby on these. That's the difference between our monoprint pad and the super clear gel ones. That product is a Cadillac. This is a Cavalier. And most teachers' budgets can't afford a Cavalier, and, or I mean a Cadillac, so a Cavalier works just well. And let's be honest, it doesn't hurt kids to learn how to clean something. So I always start with the monoprint pad on um, some sort of like placemat. I would recommend when you have students do it, if they're little, I would almost have somebody put some paint on for them. And a lot, a little goes a long way. If it's bigger than a chocolate chip, you're, you're gonna be in trouble with too much paint. That's probably the biggest um, uh, beginner 
issue and I'm just going to put a little tiny bit of white on there for mixing purposes but you put a one or two and then you're just going to rub and bray easily over there so like just even that and I'm just going to stop right there because even that is going to give I mean I didn't even do any texture in that but those colors are going to pull and it sounds a little bit like um, baking sizzling when you pull it off, are gonna pull a beautiful print. That would tell me, for my liking, to go a little bit heavier on paint. So I was conservative because I just have done it many times, but I haven't done it in a long time. I also do what I call printing dirty, which probably isn't the right thing to say to your students because that just sounds bad. But a print on top of a print isn't gonna hurt anything. A lot of times that, ah, oh, that's what happens. It's a lot better in the tubes, but now I'm probably gonna get a little bit too thick. So here's what you do. I do like the Jack Richardson brayer because it has a, Hand, it has a little bit of a lip right here. So when I set it down, it the brayer is up and the roller doesn't go on your table or your placemat and get stuck. And that paint I can use again. Um, I have too much paint on here, but I am going to take, ah, guess what I forgot? I forgot a Q-tip. Um, I'm just gonna take the back of my brush. I can also take um, texture tools but I, I love using just a uh, cotton swab. You know, Q-tip is the brand name, but I love a cotton swab. And you just sort of draw your texture in here. I notoriously am lots of swirls and circles and things like that. And I'm just doing a little bit of extra because I had so much paint on there. When there's a lot of paint, when I rub, I, it might compromise the print a little bit. Um, I also, when, when we were testing this out, I loved the art teacher, it was Jen Dahl. And um, so you can see this spot right here where that blue was super thick, um, merged together. But still, like some kids would get frustrated and wanna throw this away. I'm like, do not throw your monoprint away because you can always print on top you can always um, cut it out and use it oh my gosh in a minute you're going to see so many things but i just want to show you in the world of a ghost print because i had so much paint on there i think this ghost print is going to be beautiful um Megan, I am glad you are enjoying this. I always enjoy seeing you. Yes, this. So like I said, when, uh, and see where that spot of blue, that really showed that I had lots and lots of paint on there. And so again, somebody would be like, well, that's ugly. Yeah, it, it, it's not perfect, but it's amazing how when you, um, tear this up and use it in um, strips or chunks, or maybe I want to print something else over that. Um, maybe I want to, let's do another color for a minute. Also too, you can take your brayer and just rub it on your mat. And that will help clean it up a little bit in between because a lot of times you don't have time to clean a pad after every single use. So I went to uh, Black River Falls. I had to think for a minute. I went to Black River Falls to Jen Dahl's elementary school. And at that point in time, she was in a modular which is kind of like a trailer but you say modular because nobody wants to say they teach art in a trailer and so we practiced and practiced and practiced with littles to make sure that it would be successful and we got so many prints 
and had such a good time. So here is a great example of how that detail of the previous paint lifts off and gives really cool texture. Cleaning it, if your kids leave it like this, sorry, I forget that my camera is overhead sometimes, but if your kids le like left the classroom and left it like this, um, don't panic. Um, you can actually even just, after it dries, you can even just rub the paint off. But if you take it to the sink, use a little dish detergent on there and a little bit of elbow grease, it, it's all gonna come out and it's going to clean right back to the original. Also too, if you're doing two classes in a row, just um, jump right to the back and clean it all at the end of the day. Kids do get frustrated, but I'll be honest with you. Um, the kids in the higher grades complain way more about cleaning than the littles do. So that is the mono print pad. I'm just going to show you um, that just print after print. These are just ones that I had just practiced on. I think that was like a ball jar lid, but it just makes, that was a leaf stencil just makes really, really great prints. And you can see all the different colors. You might have to mess with um, the acrylics that you use. Some acrylics dry a little bit faster. Worst case scenario that's gonna happen is your paper's gonna get stuck and pull and it will tear the paper. And if that happens, you know, it's frustrating, but I always say you just need to do a little monoprint surgery on that. Um, why do you put the ink paint directly on the surface of the monoprint? It would work better if you put it on another surface and load the brayer before putting it, if you keep from having the glob of color where it doesn't want. Um, Tammy Wilson, you are my new favorite. Um, I don't know. I think that's how I just did it. And, you know, knowledge is power, right? So, um, I have put paper, I have put it in the brayer and done that, and that works too. Um, but my go to is always putting it right on top. And so I'm going to have to practice putting it in the palette because I actually did bring one. And you can see that my habit is just to not do that. Next on my list is tie dye. And that is my real hand in the PowerPoint because I never use gloves. I would recommend gloves for students because that only comes off um, with a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of washing or um, watered down bleach, which I wouldn't recommend for students' hands in your classroom. So gloves would definitely be necessary. But this is Jacquard Procyon um, MX dye. It's tremendous. The color is fabulous. If you are doing it on fabric, and this was this was not like tie dyed. This was just like dripped on. Um, but you um, soak it in a product called soda ash first, and that's what's going to set it. I had the coolest opportunity to work on a lesson plan with a teacher that is showed in the PowerPoint too. Um, this is watercolor paper, but when you think about um, dye, tie dyeing, you're tie dyeing cotton paper. It's You use it on natural um, surfaces. Watercolor paper is natural. It is a cotton, almost always when it's 100% cotton or natural, it's going to be linens and cottons, which lend itself to um, the dye. You don't have to use the soda ash because it's not like you're going to wash and wear your paper. So you can just use it straight out of the bottle after you mix it. Um, and then you can embellish it. This lesson plan is also included in your um, PowerPoint. And my very last go-to is a crayon, Crayola crayons, right? 
I love the way they smell. I skipped one. I skipped one. Go back. Yep, let's go back because I knew I was um, a little bit off because I saw a different piece of art, but I thought, no, that's just all my extra examples. No, this Sakura Jelly Roll White. I happened on this during the pandemic and now I am legit addicted. And so here is um, a piece similar to the one in the PowerPoint. And you can see that just all the embellishments are just so much fun to do because it just shows up. And this, it comes in a three pack. This one is the 0 0.08 and there's a 0 0.05. And I can't remember, I just stuck that right in the paint. Way to go, Chris. Um, I can't remember what the other one is because I couldn't find it. Um, because again, I took these all from my house. But look at how that embellishment is just so much fun and how it makes the artwork pop and i am very much of a dot and a spiral person but when you add those embellishments to the art it just changes the whole look and so it just gives a different dimension to it and another look and it I, th I think it's really fun. And the Sakura Jelly Roll, any of their gel pens um, are a little bit more expensive than some gel pens that you just get off the shelf because they're, the tip is patented so that all of the ink rolls or comes out of it. So when, when it's used, you will be able to see that all the ink is gone and it's fabulous. That was my second to last, and my last is the Crayola Crayon. And the 60, I, I put the 64 pack on there because if you're a boomer, you know that you wanted the 64 pack. Teachers usually put like a 24 pack on their um, supply list, but if somebody brought in that 64 pack, ah, I was so jealous. And I love, um, I love the smell of them. I love uh, that they're just a, they're just the go-to product, right? And so um, I'm going to show you just a few more pieces of um, all of this and give you a little bit of an idea of the mix. And I will also answer some questions here. We've got about eight minutes. This just happened to be a lesson plan, not a lesson plan. This happened to be a blind contour. And I'm cracking up because in Zoom meetings, this is so much fun to do. Blind contour your colleagues um, or your students. We're um, putting together a lesson plan. Karen Crosby did a lesson plan utilizing um, a blind contour in hands. Um, this was one that I didn't do, you know, as I was gonna say, that I didn't do right. I, I could have. I could have gone in and done more lines. It was sort of a practice, but I kind of liked going in with the Faber-Castell watercolors and coloring it up. Another example of just how the Faber-Castell watercolors are beautiful. This one is multimedia because there's crayon in the background. Um, there's monoprint pads that I tore up to, or prints that I tore up to create the flower and the vase. This one again is Sharpie and Faber-Castell watercolors. Oh, this one I call um, this one I call Zoom meeting, and it cracks me up. Oh, I was thinking, am I doing these upside down? No, I'm not. Um, Zoom meeting, and so you can see that um, I didn't um, I didn't darken in my um, background maybe as much as somebody would like, but I liked the look of it. But I did blind contours um, one day during a Zoom and it made me laugh because if you, if you knew the people on the Zoom, you could almost pick out who they were. And so it was just super fun. And then I went back through and I used the um, Faber-Castell watercolors to color it and it was just super fun. Here's some, this is a print 
of a, a multimedia piece that I did using uh, mono prints and Sharpie. I'm trying to think if I used, no, this was completely collaged with mono prints. And then I went and I accentuated with Sharpie to create the guitar. This was multimedia all over the place. I used some mono prints. I used some acrylic paint. I collaged. I didn't um, varnish over the top. So I just used the Mod Podge when I was putting the um, mono prints down. This is a collective piece that I used mono prints. Um, and it was collective because when I went and practiced with the kids at Black River Falls, we took lots and lots of the leftovers because um, kids could pull like five, 10 prints in a f just a few minutes. So there was tons of um, prints and they used what they want and then they let me have all the scripts. And so I just created some stuff. I know that you guys have some go-tos um, and things that are all you need. So if you're interested in um, sending me a video of um, all I need, um, reach out to me. Um, you've got my email address and I would love to hear what you need. Love the guitar, thank you so much. I did a whole series and I get giggling too because I named them um, loosely based, oh, I was going to look at the back, loosely based on Beatles songs. And so this one was called um, Strawberry Fields Guitar or something silly like that. So yeah, I crack myself up. If you um, wouldn't mind filling out the survey, you will receive the survey at the end of, no, in about an hour. I was going to say at the end of the webinar. Nope, I attach it to a follow-up. So you'll get a follow-up that will have a download for a PD certificate. It will have a link to this so that you can re-watch it. It will also have um, the survey attached. I am doing another door prize and I have some of these, um, some excess of these mono print pads. They're going to be um, a wide variety of sizes. Um, you can actually cut them down if you want, um, or you can use them a little bit larger. If you use them a little bit larger, um, make sure that um, your acrylic doesn't dry too quickly because once it's dry, obviously you're not gonna be able to pull the print off of it. So I think I will give probably 10 of those away if you fill out the survey with your honest answers. Next week is the 9th and I get to go on vacation. I'm not going anywhere, it's a staycation, welcome to COVID, but um, I do have a little bit of a break and I hope that you um, can enjoy a break too. The following week, the 16th, is the Sandwich Artist Dad. He's an artist, he is a, a graphic artist by trade, he's delightful, his name is David Laferrier, and he is, awesome so please come and enjoy that week and then the following week we have a double feature um two in a row with melody weintraub and she's going to do altered books and that's going to be a two-part series if you miss the first part it's okay because when you do when you sign up for the second part we'll send you the link to the first um and vice versa but we'll make it work um yay on really wanting the mono print um and the name of the gel pack the gel pen is the jelly roll <laughs> when i'm not dipping it in the red paint sorry everybody i am definitely your student um jelly roll by sakura um and it's the white and it comes in a pack of three all of these are listed by name and um, attached to a link. There is one other thing that I do need, and that is art educators. And I say that so sincerely because everything I have showed you is because of an art educator. Um, you inspire me and you teach me and you make me want to be better. 
we need you more than ever. And so please, please don't lose faith. Don't lose sight of what you're doing and know how important you are. Stay safe, everybody. Be healthy and keep teaching art.